Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, The Last of Europe, in which we're going to explore the free port of Magadan, rallying what remains of various Russian fleets in the Far East. Nikolai Abramov have established his own petty fiefdom based out of Magadan, making a living running refugees to the OFN and the Sphere, and shipping goods back to Russia to be sold at extortionate prices. He cares nothing for the old ideologies that he once served, not when there's money on the line, at least. Very cool. And we are now the Freeport of Magadan, which is a very unique flag under Nikolai Abramov. Very cool. And oh, let it go on. And if you like to read about him, please go right ahead. But sailors of fortune. Turbulent waves of seawater crashed upon the rugged and precipitous rocks of the shore, seeping into the small porous holes present within the sides of the old wharves and docks, protruding into the tempestuous open waters of the Sea of Okhotsk. Nikolai Abramov observed the everyday nature of the port from within a modest office overlooking a remarkable jewel of the Siberian coast, Magadan. Humbled only in the Far East by Vladivostok itself, Abramov sat himself down before an aged wooden desk littered with nautical maps and shipping records, clasping his hands together as he reviewed them with attentiveness. He once had pledged his skills in seamanship to the cause of the Russian Dude Party, sailing under the banners of national uh, dudism and, of course, that famous swastika. What naive, naive fools they were, relentlessly pursuing empty ideological principles and dogma set in place by distant and bygone men, blinding them from their necessary duties. The two separate branches claimed to be different, yet Abramov held no loyalty to either. Reminiscing about the past is pointless now, he thought. The Russian dude party had ceased to exist long ago. Their actions and deeds relegated to the annals of history, but he was still here. Abramov fixed his mind upon present matters, opening a drawer. He placed the map of the region squarely in front of himself, marked with common shipping routes. As he observed the map, he began theorizing about overlooked portions of the ocean, where a smuggled cargo could slip past unnoticed from the prying eyes of forbidden patrol ships, and which routes would net the most substantial profits. A series of vessels departed from Magadan's shores, brimming with illicit goods, bound for locations across the seas. Regardless of where they were headed, they will all return to the same place, the port nestled upon the frigid coastline of the Far East. No storms we cannot weather. And of course, we have a lot of uh, despotism under Abramov. We also have authoritarian democracy under Petlin. We have authoritarian socialists under Viktor Grishin, as well as national daddyism under Grigory Ostrovsky. Very cool. Drown out our sins in Rome. Hmm, Rome. Balmy Circulian? Cerulean waves met the rocks and pebbles of Magadan's coast. The skies were bright and cloudless, the seas were calm and placid. A ship could be seen in the distance, its hulls adorned with a stripe of dark crimson, despite the fact that dozens of vessels of the same size passed by the icy port to participate in its clandestine operations every day. The ship, in particular, attracted the fixated attention of crowds, the sailors, and dock workers. Once the ship was in port, the reason for its allure was quickly revealed as a crew unloaded crate after a crate of sweet, frag fragrant alcohol. To Nikolai Avramov, who the appeal of indulging in alcoholic beverages is something he was all too familiar with. It was a craving that needed to be satiated all once in a while, and it brought forth the ecstasy and bliss of temporarily losing awareness of one's abundance of problems and responsibilities. In the current desperate state of affairs, the elevated man was self-explanatory. An abundance of vodka and gin in Magadan itself would be certainly be a benefit. Abramov thought he was aware of the lucrative financial prospects it could bring to the territory as alcohol was desired in markets all around the world. A single yet crucial issue, however, existed. The acquisition of such goods would prove to be this a substantial challenge, as shipping routes for alcohol did not usually cross into the winters of the Sea of Okhotsk. As Abramov continued to deliberate, a thought popped into his mind, piracy. Although he did not have the adequate manpower or equipment necessary for direct involvement, he possessed valuable contacts in the South China Sea, contacts who would gladly divert Japanese alcohol shipments to the north, of course for a price. Abramov smiled as he reached for the half-empty bottle of vodka beside his desk, a rarity soon to be plentiful in the frozen northern port. Na Zodorovi. And with the national spirits, shiver my soul. Oh, shiver, shiver, shiver. As well as greed and felony. Oh boy, that's not too bad. And then we, of course, have a very salted earth. Political laws, as you can see, we've outlawed slavery. No voting here. Banned women from service. And we have segregation or segregated regiments. Hmm. Hearts black as coal. As the obfuscating darkness of night descended upon the docks and inhabitants of Magadan, the boundless oceans and limitless skies merged into one form, only being illuminated by the faint and delicate glow of the moon. In the distance, the distinctive shape of a vessel could be seen from the coastline, drifting slowly towards the horizon. The unremarkable ship, though nominally transporting a shipment of coal, ferried dozens of men, women, and children, people who wished to begin anew in shores of greater opportunity and stability. 
people who wish to abandon their dreadful livelihoods in the derelict remnants of a land once called Russia. The atmosphere aboard the ship was one of euphoria, exhilaration. The open decks were brimming with elated men, bottles of vodka in hand, celebrating their progression into a future of hope and optimism. The vivacious and ebullient cheers of ecstasy were interrupted as a deafening crash could be heard from the decks below. The vessel began to tilt gradually as a deluge of frigid seawater poured into the hull with the force of a tempestuous maelstorm, or maelstrom, slowly weighing down what had become an iron sarcophagus. The enthusiastic and merry atmosphere of the passengers had dissipated, replaced with expressions of horror and cries of fear as the tumultuous ocean slowly devoured part after part of the ship, forcing the people aboard to resort to increasingly futile attempts at survival, unwilling to accept fate. Nikolai Abramov watched from a distance. His facial expression was one of indifference, having no remorse over what he considered was just. The ship had refused to pay the full amount required for docking and exited the port. There had to be measures of retaliation, for they must be set a clear precedent. The three red flares shot up in the evening sky, a last desperate plea for rescue. A plea that would never be answered. Below the waves, they shall go. And it looks like overall we're improving society by through academic base, researching, agriculture, poverty, industrial equipment, and just, uh, expertise, as well as army professionals. Everything's going up except for nuclear stockpile. That's not too bad. But murder in the air. The frozen waters of the Sea of Okhotsk usually are calm and placid, but this time were disturbed by the worn steel holds of a dozen small and antiquated vessels adorned with the gradually dissipating insignia of the Pacific Fleet. Leonid stood at the bow of one of the ships, a meager fishing boat repurposed for their use, peering towards the immaculate sheets of drift ice present within the water, contemplating about the acquisition of rations for the week of how the men aboard a ship were going to be fed. He sighed in exasperation as grim thoughts of distress flooded his mind, overwhelming him with dread as he remembered the dire straits they were currently in. He calmed himself down, though, with the last tool still present within his mentality, or his mental arsenal. Hope! Hope that the future would not be so forlorn as today. Hope that he may return one day to a recovered and united homeland. Hope that even as the ships he possessed were paltry in comparison to the mighty vessels of decades past, he would still be able to sail towards the horizon in triumph, smiling with glee. The deafening sound of a ship's horn scattered lay in its thoughts and pulled him back into the reality. One of his men pointed towards a strange foreign ship approaching the modest flotilla. The words Free Marine Infantry were inscribed under the side of the ship, confusing Leonid as the men made contact. Soon, a small party appeared before Leonid and began reciting demands. In an emotionless tone, calling for him to surrender his ship, Leonid was taken back by the bluntness of the words, but knew that he was not in a position to negotiate as made evident by the weapons being brandished by several other men. He deliberated for a short while before deciding to flatly decline. He had sacrificed too much and told for too long to simply abandon everything. No. He would resist. Before the words of disapproval left his mouth, it collapsed onto the deck, a pool of blood gathering around his head. The culture of Magadan must be utilized, my friends. Free trade, of course. And early mobilization, ultimatum. You can have whatever we want. Wait, United Siberian. Ah, Salvation Committee. Pretty much. Cool. Main set, sail set, anchors weighed. A small fishing boat resided off the coastline of the barren wastes of the Far East. Its craftsmanship was of Manchurian origin, its modest anchor submerged into the frozen depths, lodging itself neatly between rugged underwater rocks. A Chinese man stood on the edge of the stern, his hands clenching a mechanical lever. Used to retrieve the net, as he let out a sigh of fatigue and began pulling, he failed to notice the approaching ship. A vessel slightly larger and bulkier than his own, commandeered by men dressed in drab, threadbare wool uniforms. Before a single word of protest could be uttered, one of the men jumped under the boat and proceeded to ferociously pummel the fisherman with exceeding force using a rubber cudgel before dragging him blood-soaked aboard. The man's ship was seized and taken to the hub of illicit activity that was Magadan, to be sold for a pretty penny at a smuggling market. Abramov sat squarely before his desk as he sifted through various reports from differing regions and times, sightings of sizable ships with heavy steel hulls, bearing the colors of Manchukuo, armed with imposing guns of different calibers. He slammed his fist onto the wooden table as he continued to contemplate his options. Would the self-indulgent Japanese lords to the south truly bother with such a trivial affairs as a deprivation of a handful of Chinese fishermen to the point where they would expend resources to infringe upon sovereign waters? As thoughts raced around his mind, he readjusted his thinking, regardless of whether the specific reports were factual it certainly would be reasonable to suggest Japanese interference in the Sea of Okhotsk. And as long as there is a slim possibility, his craft would be at stake. Abramov peered out towards the docks and the harbors below, brimming with workers loading and unloading crates upon crates of smuggled cargo, then towards the vast and balanced ocean stretching for uncountable miles, extending into the horizon. The future would be secured no matter what. The tides carry us forward, eyes fixed towards the future. But if, I, if you enjoyed this little video of us reading the events through the Freeport of Magadan, 
please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.